John James Godfrey was the son of poor but honest parents in the state of Mississippi. Boyhood friend of mine, bosom comrade in later years. Heaven rest his noble spirit, he is gone from us now. John James Godfrey was hired by the Hay Blossom Mining Company in California to do some blasting for them. The Incorporated Company of Mean Men, the boys used to call it. Well, one day he drilled a hole about four feet deep and put in an awful blast of powder, and was standing over it, ramming it down with an iron crowbar about nine foot long, when the cussed th struck a spark and fired the powder, and scat away John Godfrey whizzed like a skyrocket, him and his crowbar. Well, sir, he kept on going up in the air, higher and higher, till he didn't look any bigger than a boy, and he kept going on up higher and higher, till he didn't look any bigger than a doll, and he kept on going up higher and higher till he didn't look any bigger than a little small bee, and then he went out of sight. Presently he came in sight again, looking like a little small bee, and he came along down further and further till he looked as big as a doll again, and down further and further till he was as big as a boy again, and further and further till he was a full-sized man once more. And then him and his crowbar came a whizzing down and lit right exactly in the same old tracks and went to ramming down and ramming down and ramming down again, just the same as if nothing had happened. Now, you, do you know that poor cuss wasn't gone only 16 minutes, and yet the incorporated company of mean men docked him for the last time? I said I had the headache, so I excused myself and went home. And on my diary I entered another night spoiled by this offensive loafer, and a fervent curse was set down with it to keep the item company. And the very next day I packed up out of all patience and left the island. Almost from the very beginning I regarded that man as a liar. The line of points represents an interval of years at the end of which time the opinion hazarded in that last sentence came to be gratifyingly and remarkably endorsed, and by wholly disinterested persons. The man Marcus was found one morning hanging to a beam of his own bedroom, the doors and windows securely fastened on the inside, dead, and on his breast was pinned a paper in his own handwriting, begging his friends to suspect no innocent person of having anything to do with his death for that it was the work of his own hands entirely. Yet the jury brought in the astounding verdict that deceased came to his death by the hands of some person or persons unknown. They explained that the perfectly undeviating consistency of Marcus's character for thirty years towered aloft as colossal and indestructible testimony that whatever statement he chose to make was entitled to instant and unquestioning acceptance as a lie. And they that furthermore stated their belief that he was not dead, and instanced the strong circumstantial evidence of his own word that he was dead, and beseeched the coroner to delay the funeral as long as possible, which was done. And so in the tropical climate of La Hiena, the coffin stood open for seven days, and then even the loyal jury gave him up. But they sat on him again and changed their verdict to suicide induced by mental aberration. Because, said they, with penetration, he said he was dead, and he was dead. And would he have told the truth if he had been in his right mind? No, sir. Chapter 78 Return to San Francisco Ship Amusements Preparing for Lecturing Valuable Assistance Secured My First Attempt The Audience Carried All's Well That Ends Well After half a year's luxurious vagrancy in the islands, I took shipping in a sailing vessel and regretfully returned to San Francisco. A voyage in every way delightful, but without an incident, unless lying two long weeks in a dead calm eighteen hundred miles from the nearest land may rank as an incident. Schools of whales grew so tame that day after day they played about the ship, 
among the porpoises and the sharks without the least apparent fear of us, and we pelted them with empty battle, bottles for lack of better support. Twenty-four hours afterward, these bottles would be still lying on the glassy water under our noses, showing that the ship had not moved out of her place in all that time. The calm was so absolutely breathless and the surface of the sea absolutely without a wrinkle. For a whole day and part of a night we lay so close to another ship that had drifted to our vicinity that we carried on conversations with her passengers, introduced each other by name, and became pretty intimately acquainted with people we had never heard of before and have never heard of since. This was the only vessel we saw during the whole lonely voyage. We had fifteen passengers, and to show how hard-pressed they were at last for occupation and amusement, I will mention that the gentlemen gave a good part of their time every day during the calm to trying to sit on an empty champagne bottle lying on its side and thread a needle without touching their heels to the deck or falling over, and the ladies sat in the shade of the mainsail and watched the enterprise with absorbing interest. When we were at sea five Sundays, and yet, but for the almanac, we never would have known but that all the other days were Sundays, too. I was home again in San Francisco, without means and without employment. I tortured my brain for a saving scheme of some kind, and at last a public lecture occurred to me. I sat down and wrote one in a fever of hopeful anticipation. I showed it to several friends, but they all shook their heads. They said nobody would come to hear me, and I would make a humiliating failure of it. They said that as I had never spoken in public, I would break down in the delivery anyhow. I was disconsolate now. But at last an editor slapped me on the back and told me to go ahead, he said. Take the largest house in town and charge a dollar a ticket. The audacity of the proposition was charming. It seemed fraught with practical worldly wisdom, however. The proprietor of the several theaters endorsed the advice and said I might have his handsome new opera house at half price, fifty dollars. In sheer desperation I took it, on credit, for sufficient reasons. In three days I did a hundred and fifty dollars worth of printing and advertising and was the most distressed and frightened creature on the Pacific coast. I could not sleep. Who could, under such circumstances? For other people there was facetiousness in the last line of my posters, but to me it was plaintive with a pang when I wrote it. Doors open at seven and a half. The trouble will begin at eight. That line has done good service since. Showmen have borrowed it frequently. I have even seen it appended to a newspaper advertisement reminding school pupils in vacation what time next term would begin. <coughs> As those three days of suspense dragged by, I grew more and more unhappy. I had sold 200 tickets among my personal friends, but I feared they might not come. My lecture, which had seemed humorous to me at first, grew steadily more and more dreary, till not a vestige of fun seemed left, and I grieved that I could not bring a coffin on the stage and turn the thing into a funeral. I was so panic-stricken at last that I went to three old friends, giants in stature, cordial by nature, and stormy-voiced, and said, This thing is going to be a failure. The jokes in it are so dim that nobody will ever see them. I would like to have you sit in the parquet and help me through. They said they would. Then I went to the wife of a popular citizen and said that if she was willing to do me a very great kindness, I would be glad if she and her husband would sit prominently in the left-hand stage box where the whole house could see them. I explained that I should need help and would turn toward her and smile as a signal when I had been delivered of an obscure joke. And then I added... Don't wait to investigate, but respond. She promised. Down the street I met a man I never had seen before. He had been drinking and was beaming with smiles and good nature. He said, My name's Sawyer. You don't know me, but that don't matter. I haven't got a cent, but if you knew how bad I wanted to laugh, you'd give me a ticket. Come now, what do you say? 
Is your laugh hung on a hair trigger? That is, is it crucial, or can you get it off easy? My drawling infirmity of speech so affected him that he laughed a specimen or two that struck me as being about the article I wanted, and I gave him a ticket and appointed him to sit in a second circle in the center and be responsible for that division of the house. I gave him minute instructions about how to detect indistinct jokes, and then went away and left him chuckling placidly over the novelty of the idea. I ate nothing on the last of the three eventful days. I only suffered. I had advertised that on this third day the box office would be open for the sale of reserved seats. I crept down to the theater at four in the afternoon to see if any sales had been made. The ticket seller was gone. The box office was locked up. I had to swallow suddenly or my heart would have gone out. No sales, I said to myself. I might have known it. I thought of suicide, pretended illness, flight. I thought of these things in earnest, for I was very miserable and scared. But of course I had to drive them away and prepare to meet my fate. I could not wait for half past seven. I wanted to face the horror and end it, the feeling of m many a man doomed to hang, no doubt. I went down back streets at six o'clock and entered the theater by the back door. I stumbled my way in the dark among the racks, ranks of canvas scenery and stood on the stage. The house was gloomy and silent, and its emptiness depressing. I went into the dark among the scenes again, and for an hour and a half gave myself up to the horrors, wholly unconscious of everything else. Then I heard a murmur. It rose higher and higher and ended in a crash, mingled with cheers. It made my hair rise. It was so close to me and so loud. There was a pause, and then another. Presently came a third. And before I well knew what I was about, I was in the middle of the stage, staring at a sea of faces, bewildered by the fierce glare of the lights, and quaking in every limb with a terror that seemed like to take my life away. The house was full, aisles and all. A tumult in my heart and brain and legs continued a full minute before I could gain any command over myself. Then I recognized the charity and the friendliness in the faces before me, and little by little my fright melted away, and I began to talk. Within three or four minutes I was comfortable and even content. My three chief allies with three auxiliaries were on hand in the parquet, all sitting together, all armed with bludgeons, and all ready to make an onslaught upon the feeblest joke that might show its head. And whenever a joke did fall, their bludgeons came down, and their faces seemed to split from ear to ear. Sawyer, whose hearty countenance was seen looming redly in the center of the second circle, took it up, and the house was carried handsomely. Inferior jokes never fared so royally before. Presently I delivered a bit of serious matter with impressive, impressive auction. It was my pet, and the audience listened with an absorbed hush that gratified me more than any applause. And as I dropped the last word of the clause, I happened to turn and catch Mrs. Blank's intent and waiting eye. My conversation with her flashed upon me, and in spite of all I could do, I smiled.